we're going to do today uh, is talk to our uh, esteemed panel of growers and landscapers to uh, help both of those groups do a better job serving and working for each other and in the end helping our customers, whether it be commercial uh, landscapes uh, or the end consumer. Ed, how do you pick a, uh, a color supplier? It's service, uh, quality, um, probably those two factors and then actually price comes in last. If somebody's giving me great service and good quality, we don't worry about what it's going to cost us. With some of the greenhouses, we were already in and it, w it worked out really well, but then we needed to find some more. And sometimes I'll visit them for three or four seasons before I'll, I'll do business with them. I'm fairly slow to, to go in with somebody and then very slow to change once I feel really comfortable. We'll introduce stuff a year or two ahead of time. Ed and I had a couple fist fights for the first year, but he wanted big begonias in color. I mean, right, I mean, you know, and I'd ship them a little fresher. And uh, so we're, there's been some education that we're producing a just on time, ready fresh, gonna grow, gonna pop. You know, my key to it is it's, you know, we're all a team in it together. What's the, uh, the biggest factor impacting your ability to sell or to sell more to a landscape customer? Getting a weekly fax on availability and knowing that, you know, there's a good chance we're going to be able to fulfill what they need. I just want to, uh, I want to get what I ordered. We've had vendors in the past who you order a red begonia and a pink one shows up. That's, that's not going to work for us. It's definitely got to be some quick response time because, you know, in the, in the world of ordering, otherwise we're looking for it somewhere else very quickly. So if there's no response, it's, it's not going to be there. Get your numbers together early, get them to me, which um, yep. is always yep. a challenge. Just send us a good quality plant, uh, full, uh, doesn't have to be in full flower, but I like that the buds, you know, some color or some buds. I want it moist, doesn't have to be wet, but I want it to be moist so that when we put it, put it, set it down, it doesn't dry up in, you know, an hour. Drop in a cart in our yard so we can have a little time to unload it while we're trying to get crews out. And so when you say you're gonna be there at seven o'clock, you better be there at 6.30, you know, and pull it in ready to go and we're ready to unload you. Speculation, just to have it, if it gets old in the greenhouse, yeah. is really dangerous right. because a low quality plant loses that business forever. What are any of the kind of hot or up and coming trends right now? color in the HOAs is going to continue, but the commercial side, that's where we're going to see the biggest changes. If the client wants to cut out dollars and they still want color, then what goes in its place are going to be low flowering uh, plants. So like your roses, perennials, uh, shrubs, low flowering shrubs, things like that. Or in some cases it stays open if they don't have the money to do anything. The trend for us was definitely go from, you know, the, the challenge of coming up with the plant palette from uh, winter color immediately to summer. And that transition is very, very difficult. So they were really trying to cut corners with, with really just two change out. I think there's gonna be more mixes in the future. I see less solid, but more mixes. So instead of them having to buy 80 flats of four colors and do their own bed, we change different mixes and just blend our own seed. Soil preparation. I think more flowers die from the soil not being prepared properly. So if we could all just talk, start talking to the landscape industry, the home garden industry, and preparing the soil. And if it's, because if it's not, if you're just dropping it in unprepared soil, no matter how quality a product it is, it's gonna die. We've been using LE pots for about three years now in our 1801 flats. It's, it's definitely cut our production by about 30%. So. Uh, it's a savings for us, and again, it's part of sustainability too. And we grow them as kind of a no waste type product, where we're using the LE pots, we're recycling all of our plastic, we're composting everything as it gets pulled out, and so we're able to keep up with the annuals business, but be as green as possible. Yeah, you know, we share that with our customers, especially the ones who are concerned about their LEED certification, because we have huge corporate sites that they want their LEED certification, but they also want the impact that annuals provide. 
How important is, is new stuff? You know, a lot of the, the new stuff that's out there, just getting it visible out in the landscape to where it makes enough of, a, of an impact, we've got to find a way to sell that value that, that's a superior item that will, will do well, but it's, it's, it's all about education. Now they want color, they, they put it in our hands to pick, pick the variety, and then, then it goes back to our folks, and we're, we're gonna select for um, no deadheading, it's a self-cleaning plant that doesn't need to be pruned, gets no insects, gets no diseases, doesn't need to be watered, <laughs> is in flower all the time, and there are a number of plants out there who that fit the bill. When I put it out there, my name's on that, and I want it to be perfect. But a lot of those guys that are coming into the re wholesaler, they need help, and they need they need uh, ideas. and And I think if if you know a lot of what we see here could be out in an Esplanade or you know an Always in Bloom program or something like that, it'd be, it'd be very inspirational and and help sell a lot of these new genetics. And I think, I think that's what the industry needs.